lovely to be here this morning, being in the house of the Lord and worshiping together as a family, as a body, see some incredible things take place during worship time, see some chains broken, some lives healed, and uh, I believe uh, the Lord has a word for us today about love, and I'm excited about that. I love love. That's what we talked about last week. I love love, man. Love, love. So anyway, I do want to begin by reviewing a little bit from last week. <clears throat> if you weren't here, last week we began our series titled Love First. Look at that. Beautiful. Love First. We began our series titled Love First, and uh, we, we talked about uh, different ways to love that in our, our American English language, uh, we use the word love, and we use the word love pretty frequently, uh, but it can mean different things, like when I say that I love my wife and I say that I love ice cream, those are not exactly the same kind of loves, I, I don't think. Um, although I really do love ice cream. Man, those, that's probably not a good example. No. I'm just teasing. I can't find my wife. Where is she? She's done gone. Oh, there she is. Okay, good. She's still in the building. We're good. There's different, the, the, the way that we use the term love or the word love can be applicable in many different scenarios. I, I even love my daughter differently than I love my wife. It's a different kind of a love. And so we talked about that a little bit. We talked about uh, in the Greek language, while in American language we have, or English language, we have one word for love that we use. In the Greek language, there are four different words, and we talked about those. First one was eros. And that was a sexual kind of a love, a desire kind of a love. And, and in fact, that, was not, that term, eros, is not actually found in the New Testament. So when we're talking about love, we're talking about the love series, and we're reading scripture, it's not that kind of a love. We're talking about something a little bit different. We talked about uh, storge love, which is a familial or a uh, parental kind of a love. It's, the, it's, a, it's a natural love that occurs like between a mother and her child or a father and his child, that it was a, it's a love that takes place naturally, that you don't have to teach how to love, it just, it, it automatically occurs, it's there. That's a familial kind of a love, it's called storge. Uh, that also is not found in the New Testament, but its opposite is found in the New Testament. And so we talked about that last week. We talked about the third type, which is phileo, or philia, which is, if you combine the word philia with Adelphos, you get Philadelphia. Philadelphia, which is brotherly love. It's a brotherly type of love. That's an easy way to remember that. Uh, it's a love between uh, like a, a very best friend, so a very, very close companion. It's a love that's, that is based on affection towards one another. I, 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 really, I really, really care for you. And it's a love that's based upon feelings. I feel this way about you. I, I, I care for you so much. And it, it wants to see uh, success with the other person. It wants to make them happy as well. That's a Phileo kind of a love, but the, the love that we talked about the most and we focus on the most, and this is the one that is uh, the most important in what we're talking about with love first in our series today, is agape love. And this love was rarely used before the New Testament, uh, but it began uh, being used more prominently in the New Testament to describe God's kind of a love for us and his kind of, kind of a love and describing who he is, his nature. First John tells us that God is love, and it says God is agape. It's this kind of a love. And so that's what it's talking about. And that kind of a love is an unconditional kind of a love. That kind of a love is a no strings attached kind of a love. It's, it's you don't have to do anything for me for me to love you. I choose to love you. It's a willful love. The biggest difference between agape love and, and the other kinds of love is that agape love is a willful choice. It's not based upon feeling. It's not, it's not about how I feel towards you. That's going to determine my love for you. It's I determine my love for you based upon my will. I choose to love you regardless of what you are doing, regardless of what is going on, whether you love me back or not. I choose to love you. And that's the kind of a love that God had and has for us. That's why he, we could, he can say that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. That's how his love was demonstrated to us, that I loved you first. And you didn't have to do anything while you were a sinner, while you were opposed to me. I loved you so much that I sent my son to die for you because I love first. 
That's the kind of love that our God has. That's agape love. And so that's what we're talking about today. When we're talking about love first, we've been breaking down, we, we broke down um, the first three verses in 1 Corinthians 13, known as the love chapter. Uh, it's, a, it's a beautiful, beautiful passage. And so we broke down the first three verses, and when we see that word love, it's this kind of love, agape love, okay? So understanding the, the Greek helps us to understand a little bit more about what was trying to be conveyed, what was trying to be said. And it helps us, it leaves, it leaves a little less to our own interpretation. Amen? Because how many know we can mess things up in our own interpretation? I want to I wanna interpret things the way the Lord intends for them to be interpreted. Amen? And so we talked about, uh, just a review from last week, 1 Corinthians 13, verse 1 says this, if I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And we talked about that when we talked about Basically, what Paul is saying here is that when I, it doesn't matter how good of a speaker I am, how eloquently I can speak or convey my points, if I can speak in 17 different languages and can communicate with 17 different countries, that doesn't matter if I don't say it in love. If I don't speak in love, because when I don't speak in love, I say nothing. Paul says, when you don't speak in love, you say nothing. That was verse one. Verse two says this, and if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains but have not love, I am nothing. So now Paul is saying that, you know what, you can can operate in all these spiritual gifts, which are good things. Faith, prophecy, knowledge, those things are, those are really good things. Those are gifts from the Holy Spirit. But if you operate in those gifts, yet you do not have love, then you are nothing. See, oftentimes we like to, to associate who we are by the things that we do, our deeds, our actions, what we do, that, that makes me who I am. Paul is saying that it doesn't matter what you do. If it's a good thing, if it's a gift from the Holy Spirit, if you don't do it in love, you're nothing. You are nothing. So without love, I say nothing. Without love, I am nothing. And finally, in verse three, he says this, if I give away all that I have, And if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. Both of these two things are very noble. To give up your body for someone else, to die for someone else, and also to give away all of your possessions to the poor, to give money away to the poor. Those are two very noble things, right? If I sat here and I wrote a check, a million dollar check to to somebody who was in need, that's a very noble thing to do. But if our intentions, our motivation is wrong, if I'm not motivated out of love, If I'm motivated out of, well, I'm really just trying to get eyes on me. I want you to see how good of a person that I am. If my motivation is wrong, then I gain and profit nothing. Paul is saying that your motivation has to be love. If you do the things that you do, which are good things, giving your life up for someone else, Scripture tells us there's no greater love than that. But if my motivation is not out of love, if it's out of obligation or if it's out of duty or something other than love, then I profit nothing. I gain nothing. So without love, you gain nothing. Without love, I gain nothing. So without love, I say nothing. Without love, I am nothing. And without love, I gain nothing. So let's take those three things real quick and think about the opposite of that. What is that saying? What is that saying? It says that with love, love says everything. Without love, I say nothing. Love says everything. Without love, I am nothing. Love is everything. And without love, I gain nothing. Love gains everything. That's a powerful picture, that it's all about love. It's love first. And that makes complete sense because that's what remains. Love remains. And so that's why we're talking about love first today because we want to kick off this year right. We want to kick off this year and, and, and have our priorities in order that we can do, we can talk about this entire year about doing great things for the kingdom of God. We can talk about giving money and helping the poor. We can talk about operating in faith. We can talk about operating in prophecy. We can talk about all these other things. But if we don't do it out of love, then this year has been a waste because it's all about love. And that's why we're starting in love today in this series. So today we're going to continue in our series, and I titled this sermon, uh, Love's Makeup. And we're going to talk about, it's a little deeper uh, look into the attributes of love. And so, so today with that, you know, we're supposed to love the world, right? To me, I think that's the very easy part, loving the world, because loving the world is kind of an abstract or theoretical concept. 
What's hard is loving people, right? Getting down to the nitty gritty and actually loving people. Like, oh yeah, man, I, I love, I love the world. I love. Well, what about this guy? Oh, oh, oh you're asking an awful lot. I'm sure many of you all have probably felt the same at one point in time or another that, you know, in theory, loving, loving the world and loving people, yeah, yeah. But then you talk about actually doing it in application, and it's like, oh, wait, this is hard. This is hard. I don't, I don't know about this. And, you know, that's, the, lo- loving, loving in general isn't too challenging. It's loving when it gets on a personal level. That's when it gets hard. And so that's exactly why we're starting this series is because we want to we wanna dive into the nitty-gritty. We want to get in a little bit deeper and give, give practical ways. How, do I, how, can I, how can I do this? You know, because you can know all about love. You could be the love guru. You can know everything, every, every little bit there is to know about love. But if you don't walk in it, then it benefits you nothing. You know, it's like if I, if I knew everything about how to be a millionaire, I could teach every single person how to be a millionaire. But if I never applied those principles... I wouldn't be a millionaire, right? It's the same thing with love, except that love is not about feeling. It's not about knowing. Love is about action. And that's the difference between love and agape love, real love, and what we've been talking about. That's, what, that's one of the things we talked about last week was that agape love demonstrates and does its action. It's not just a feeling or a sentiment. I don't just, I love you. It's, I dem- he demonstrated his love in this, that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. This was God's love demonstrated. He didn't just say, I love these people. Man, I just love those people. I love those people. I love this world. No, he did something about it because agape love is action. And so that's what we're talking about today. It's not about uh, what we feel, but it's about what we actually do. I think that's probably one of the most, the single most important takeaways of this whole thing. If you take away nothing else, take this away, that love does. Love does. It doesn't just think about. It doesn't just feel. It does. Love does. So I want to challenge you today to to, to do, to walk in love, to operate in love, not just know about it, but to actually do it and take it and apply it. Because that's what love does. It's not just about feels. And you know, that's so contrary to what we're told today. Because if you think about, just go out and hear, (laughs) how do you feel about this? It's all about our feelings. Have you noticed that? It's, everything is all about our feelings. How do you feel about this? How does that make you feel? I feel this way when you blank this. Today, I feel like I'm a boy. Tomorrow, I feel like I'm a girl. I mean, these are like real life stuff. Maybe things that we thought we would never have to, to go through, but this is stuff that's going on right now. What is your truth? Speak your truth. How do you feel about this? It's all about feelings. And that's not what love is. Love is not all about feelings. Love is about action. Love is not a feeling. Love is not determined by feeling. True love is not determined by feeling. Because see, your feelings, your emotions can change like the weather. It's like this day I'm feeling like this, but this day I feel like this. You know, I had three cups of coffee today, so I feel like this. I feel really good. And today, I didn't have anything to eat or any coffee, so I'm feeling a little bit, (sighs) yeah. Our feelings can change just like the weather, but love doesn't change. Love remains. Love is constant. Love is not determined by how we feel. Not agape love. Thank God. (laughs) Amen. Because think about that. Think about if God's love changed like the weather. Holy moly. Our God is not bipolar. Our God loves. Our God is love. And so as we're looking through this, we're going to look through the next three scriptures today, the next three verses. I want to challenge you today. This is, a, this is a familiar passage. 1 Corinthians 13 is a familiar passage. If you've ever gone to a wedding, I'm sure you've probably heard this. It's a very familiar passage. So it's easy for us when we're reading familiar passages to kind of next and dismiss it. Okay, so I want to challenge you today that even though this may be familiar, even though you may be able to quote this, recite this forward and backward, backward and forward, upside down and inside out, I want to challenge you today to open yourself up, to hear from the Holy Spirit, to receive, because he is speaking, and this is a very, 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 I cannot stress this enough, important 
concept, love. This is something that is very important. We love first. So I want to challenge you today. I want this to push you towards a new and a greater and a deeper way of loving because we're called to love as the body of Christ. And I believe my picture of this church, which I believe is the Lord's picture, is that we are walking pictures of love to our community, that they see you, they know that there is something different about you. You're not like the others. You're not like the other Christians that I know. No, I'm filled with love. I'm an actual picture of Jesus, which I think that's who we're supposed to be. So I challenge you today, be ready to receive. We're going to go through these three verses, and there's actually 11 different descriptions of love here. So if you have your notes, you're going to get 11 different points here. That sounds like a lot, I know. Trust me, I'll go, we'll get through them. There's 11 different descriptions of love here, and three are positive, eight are negative. And I think that's intentional because Paul is saying, this is what love is. And this is what it is not, just in case I wasn't clear enough. Let me be very clear about this, okay? So we're going to start in verse 4, 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 4. Are you ready? Are you ready? Okay. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud or arrogant. I'm just going to read it verse by verse, and then we're going to break it down. How's that sound? So let's start here. Here's point number one. You got your notes? Point number one, boom, right here. First, love is patient. Love is patient. What is that word? In the King James, it was long-suffering. Long-suffering. Suffering long. <laughs> long-suffering. Long-suffering does not, <laughs> yeah, boo. <laughs> oh, we've hit a nerve already. Dang. <laughs> oh, man. Long suffering, long suffering. It, love does not get tired of waiting. And you know, in a, in a society, in a culture right now where everything is instant, like instant gratification, I can have my cake and eat it too right now. In fact, I could have it five minutes ago. You know, if I have to wait more than five minutes for my coffee to, to, to brew, or if I have to wait more than five minutes in the line at McDonald's, or if, if I have to wait, Goodness gracious, that's the, end, that's, the, that's the worst thing in the world, right? It's just the, that's just the worst. There is nothing worse. Love is patient. Love is long-suffering. So if that's you today, chickity check yourself. <laughs> Actually, the particular word that Paul used here uh, for patient or long-suffering deals with not difficult situations. It deals with difficult people. Think about that for just a second. Because I'm guarantee you that every single person in here, when I said difficult person, you saw their face. <laughs> you, you know what I'm talking about, right? You know that person. Paul is saying that love is patient. Love is long-suffering. And it specifically has to do with people. Because, see, that's what this is about. Love is about people. This is about relationship. This is not a religion, guys. This is about a relationship with a God and a Father who loves and loves incredibly. And he wants us to demonstrate that kind of a love to people. It's about relationship. While we do go through difficult situations, and we can be patient in those situations, more importantly, he wants us to be patient with people and difficult people. Because it's easy to be patient with people who are nice and easy and fun to be around. It's a lot harder <laughs> When you're around someone who's a know-it-all, who thinks they've got it all figured out, who rubs you the wrong way, complete opposite personalities, it's a lot harder that way. But love is long-suffering, and it's slow to give in to resentment and despair. I'm just going to let that sink in. A picture of love being patient is like this. Love is like someone who has been wronged. Have you ever been wronged in your life? Someone ever wronged you? Love is like someone who has been wronged and has it within them, within their power, capability to get even. You know, it's, it's okay for me to get even. They did this to me. But love chooses not to. That's the kind of patience that love has. 
that, you know what, even though you may have wronged me and I have every right to get back at you, I'm not going to because I love you and I choose to love you. That's what love is. That's point one. Point two, love is kind. What is kindness? It's kind of a, we, we know what kindness is, but what is kindness, right? It's a, it can be described as like a sweet usefulness, right? Kindness or, or love is, love is quick to react and to help others, and it's eager to help others in need. You know, love and kindness is, is um, I would consider that probably the universal language. Whether you speak English or you speak a different language, an act of kindness towards someone, you don't have to speak the same language, right, to get that. And here's why I think that is. Because love does not communicate on an intellectual level, it communicates on a heart level. And I think that's very, very important for us to understand is that, you know what, I could, I could sit here and I could talk theology with you all day long. I mean, I couldn't. I'm not a theologian. But we could sit here and try to argue points about this and this and this and this and talk about this and this is why you should this. And, but at the end of the day, if it's not motivated out of love, we don't reach the heart. We're just reaching the head. You know, and so I could, I could argue with you apologetics all day long about why you should do this and why you shouldn't do this and why this is right and why this is wrong. But at the end of the day, if I have not love, I say nothing, right? That's what Paul's talking about, that everything has to be rooted and based in love. Everything that we do is a, is a motivator, is motivated by love. And so even if those arguments are correct, even if the, the things that you're saying is right, if it's not set out of love, it's not motivated out of love, then you're saying nothing and you're not reaching people. You're arguing on an intellectual level, which is very basic. Love is deeper than that. Love hits the heart. Just food for thought. Mark Twain called kindness a language that the deaf can hear and the blind can read. I think that's a pretty cool picture. Again, it's, it's love communicating on a different level because it touches the heart. Third, Love does not envy. This is, envy is, 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 is where I think that you have too much and I think that I have too little and I want what you have. I mean, uh, kind of basic, uh, easy way to put that. Or I, I, I want what you've got or, and you, you know, this, this is the exact opposite of love. <laughs> love is generous. Love says that I rejoice with you when you're successful. When, when, when you've done things and, and, and good things have happened in your life, I rejoice with you. I'm happy for you. I'm genuinely happy for you. I can genuinely rejoice with you. That's what love is. It doesn't say, well, they, they don't deserve that. Well, if only you knew what she did last week. That's not what love does. Love is genuinely happy is genuinely rejoices when someone else has success. So here's a question. How do you respond to the success and the good fortune of those around you? Because that's a good way to, to measure where your love level's at. How do you respond when you hear that someone else is having, uh, having success? How do you respond when someone else seems happy and you don't? Talking about practical Everyday kind of stuff, right? How do you respond when you are going through the pits and someone else is on top of the mountain? How do you respond? Well, they're just uh, the worst. Come on, I know that's not that. I know that that is a response because I've I've had that response. Like, oh, here we go again. Got to tell me how great you are, how great things are in your life. How do you respond? How do you respond when someone else can do something that you cannot? How do you respond when they have gain where you have lack? How do you respond when someone else has won where you have lost? How do you react to that? Because you know, if you look hard enough, you'll always be able to find someone who is smarter, stronger, prettier, handsomer, skinnier, more intelligent. You're, you're, you're going to always be able to find someone who is like that. How do you respond? What is your response? Not based on your feelings, but based on love. 
See, this is what, why love is different. Because at that moment, I would probably feel like garbage. I'd probably feel like punching him in the face. Come tell me about your success one more time. I'd probably feel that way. But love does not envy. Love does not respond that way. And this is a test of your love. This is real stuff. It's not abstract. It's not theory. Fourth, love does not boast. It does not brag. It is not pompous or conceited or haughty. One of our favorite phrases around here, it's not about you. It's not about you, man. Because if it's about me, then I can brag about how good and how awesome I am. You know what I'm saying? Like, I've got these sweet new kicks. <laughs> Check it out, bro. It's not about you. Love does not boast. In fact, this word uh, could be translated as a windbag. <laughs> it reminds me of a, of a Jungle Book. You pompous old windbag. Like, I love that. <laughs> So if you hear somebody, or if you're acting like a pompous old windbag, that's not love. That's not love. That is not love, okay? It does not brag. It doesn't seek the applause of others. You know, this is big. I'm a firstborn child. Approval is a big thing in a firstborn child's life. I want to do everything right. I want to make sure that you approve of me. I want to seek approval because I have to have it. I gotta do everything right. And my biggest fear is disappointing people as a firstborn. You know, that may be my personality before I receive Christ because once I receive Christ, it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. I take on your DNA now, Lord. It's not about me. It's not about my feelings. Love does not boast. Sometimes it's best just to not say anything at all, right? Number five, love is not proud or arrogant. It's not puffed up, doesn't walk with its chest out with an inflated opinion of itself. Boy, I'm the stuff. That's not love. That's not love. You know, if I, if I stop and think about it, the people who I truly admire are people who appear ordinary. <laughs> they don't think of themselves as something amazing. They're just people living and loving and, and walking. You know, and, and to me, what a great picture that is. The people that I most admire, that's how they see themselves. And that's the kind of person that we're all supposed to be, walking in love, because love is not proud. Love does not boast. Love is not arrogant. And you know, those who, who do walk that way, let me just say this. Those who walk in a way as to draw attention to themselves, to puff their chest out, or to have a higher opinion of who they are, they're just trying to convince themselves of who they are instead of receiving who God says that they are. Because if, 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 if all it takes, all it takes is for us to get into the word or for somebody to explain to me, what does the Lord say about you? Find your identity in him. Because that is truth, and that's something to be proud of. It's not about me, it's about how you see me and what I can receive. It's about the love that you have for me as a child, as a son, as a daughter. Not about the things that I can do and how, how awesome I can be. It's all about you. And that's why we, as believers, have to understand what that is and have to understand what the love of God is and what that looks like so that we can share it with people who think I've got to act this way in order to, this is who I am. We have to understand who we are and know our identity and be secure in that because of the love of God so that we can freely receive and freely give because that's what the world needs. Amen? Yeah. Are you still with me this morning? Yeah. I'm, I'm going to go a little quicker through here. We're on <laughs> our second verse now. Uh, verse 5 says this, it is not rude, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs. So point number six, love is not rude. This covers a lot of territory, I think. Love is not ill-mannered. It's not rude. I know that rude person. I've been that rude person. 
But love is courteous and it's polite and it's considerate of other people. You know, Mama always said, it costs you nothing to be nice. You may not know how to do everything. You may not know uh, what's going on, but it costs you nothing to be nice. You can be nice to someone because that's what love is. It's courteous of people and who they are. It's considerate of people. That's what love is. And you know what? I have some advice for someone today. Speaking of courtesy, you don't always have to say what you're thinking. You don't always have to post what you're thinking. (laughs) Because I'll be honest, I've read some posts and I've heard some words. I'm like, dang. It's hard to find Jesus in those words. And if I see it, you know the people around you see it. And those are the people we're trying to reach. Amen. Love is not rude. It's not ill-mannered. It doesn't have to always say what's on its mind. Sometimes it zips the lip, even if those things are true. See, that's the thing. Well, I just got to speak my truth. I just got to speak. It's true. If it's not spoken in love, you say nothing. Scripture says to speak the truth in love. If it's not spoken in love, it's nothing. You don't always have to say what's on your mind. Number seven, love is not self-seeking. I like this one. It's not my way or the highway. It's not about me. And here's a big one. And I will say this. This is a huge pet peeve of mine. When you get married, one of the things that, that specifically men hear often is that this is the last time you will be right. <laughs> Let me say this right now. That's wrong. That's wrong. That's not love. That's not love. And if you want a relationship to last, it's not going to look like that. Why do you think it's like over half of our marriages now end in divorce? What kind of advice are we receiving? She's always right. She's always right. This is the last time that that you're going to be right. That is horrible advice because that's not love. Because see, love is that it's not about me. It's not about me. It's not about her. Love says I choose to serve you. Doesn't matter whether I'm right or wrong. I'm still going to love you. I choose to love willfully. And if you can base your marriage and relationships off of that, each person giving 100% of their heart, then you can be successful. Because see, in a marriage, it's not my wife's job to make me happy. And it's not my job to make her happy. It's my job to love her. And it's her job to love me. And if we can agree and understand that, then our marriage is going to be Bomb diggity. (laughs) It's a loose translation. (laughs) Love does not keep a checklist. Okay? Love does not say, well, I did this, 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 and this, and what did you do? You only did this and this. That's not love. That's not love. Love is, let's do it like Jesus did it, in service, and not worrying about the credit. Number eight, love is not easily angered. A lot of us, this this one probably hits us right between the eyes. Love is not easily provoked. It is not quick-tempered. It does not blow up, and it is not irritable. Some of you are like, man, y'all just described me. No, you described him. You didn't describe me. You described him. That's not me. This is uh, an area I think some Christians get in trouble with. That's because we're crusty. So angry all the time. And you know why I think that is? Because that's a religious spirit, not love. 
when, when, when all, everything that I've ever been taught or grown up in is all about do this, don't do this, do this, don't do this. You got to act like this. You got to look like this and you got to be this. And, and if you don't, well, then you're a terrible person and you're going to hell. And, and we, don't, we don't hang around those people. If that's the picture that I've always had, that's a religious spirit. Because Jesus, he was a wine bibber. He hung out with the sinners, right? Jesus is the epitome of love, right? Jesus is the epitome of love. And he was the one that was hanging around with those people. Man, right between the eyes. This is what love is. It's not easily angered. It's not quick-tempered. It's not a crusty Christian. It's love. By contrast, love is good-natured. It's easygoing, and it's quick to forgive. You wrong. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. I want to be around you. That's, a, that's an easy way to <laughs> see, because, you know, some people, you don't have to be a Christian to walk in love. I know there's some people that I love to be around that don't profess Christ, but they walk in more love than some Christians that I know. How sad is that? And this is an easy way to dismiss this because this is my temperament. This is my personality. I'm just, I have a short wick. No, maybe that was who you were. But in Christ, you are a new creation. The old things have passed away. All things are new, including your personality. You take on his personality. As I abide in you, and as I begin to seek and commune with you more and more and daily, I begin to take on that personality. I begin to take on the personality of love, which is not quick-tempered. It's not easily angered. It's quick to forgive, and it's easygoing. And you know, that that might hit some of you today. A quick temper is a symptom of a much deeper-rooted problem, a problem that only God's love can heal. And sometimes that's, that's... we need to receive that, and sometimes we need to let some things go. You know, it's, it's an action on our part. I have to be able to receive the love of God, but I also have to be able to let go of some things that I'm holding on to, some deep-seated bitterness maybe, some, some, some hurts or some wounds that maybe have taken place. You know, you, you might have every single reason to be able to retaliate, remember? But love doesn't. It chooses not to. I was hurt. That's why I act this way. Yeah, but love doesn't do that. Love says, I forgive you, and I'm letting it go. Love is not easily angered. And number nine, love keeps no record of wrongs. This one is one of my favorites, because love does not record how many times you've committed an offense. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. I mean, seriously. Think about that. The love of God, the love that God has for us, I am not keeping record of your offense. I am not keeping record of your offense, people. How awesome is that? That's how much I love you. I'm not keeping record of your offense. I love you. God, that's, that's amazing. That's amazing. Love doesn't hold things over people's heads. Been there, done that. Love is not the silent treatment. As the place got silent. <laughs> love is not the silent treatment, nor is it the passive aggressive treatment. Come on. (laughs) Dilly dilly. (laughs) Here's a picture. Love quickly hits the delete key. Love is format hard drive, erase. That's what love is. Says, you know what, I'm not even I'm not even keeping record of that. It's gone. I don't recall that. I choose not to recall that. I let the past be the past and let it stay there, and I don't bring that up anymore because I choose to love you and see you for who you are as someone who is a son or a daughter of the King of Kings and who is my brother or sister. Amen? I release you from your past, from all of your wrongs. That's what love is. What a great picture, man. Never to be brought up again. All right, 1 Corinthians 13, verse 6. This is our last one. I promise we'll go through this one quickly. Are you still with me? All right, we're almost there. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. Number 10, love does not delight in evil. It takes no pleasure in wrongdoing. 
And it isn't happy when bad things happen to other people. Goodness gracious, look at the news. Watch the news. Where's the good stuff? It's like page 57, buried way back here. Because it's all about bad news cells. That's what keeps me interested. You got to hear about all the negativity. What's Trump doing now? What's Obama doing now? It's all about the negative. It's all about the bad stuff that is happening. Love does not rejoice in that. It does not take heart in that. It does not take pleasure in that. Love takes, rejoices with the truth. It takes pleasure in good things, in the truth. That's what love is. It does, love does not say, well, they deserved it. it serves them right. They're going to get what's coming. That's not what love says. <laughs> it may be what happens, but it's not what love says. Love does not enjoy passing on bad news, and it turns away from gossip and rumor. And that's, that's something that we can easily handle. When someone comes up to you, did you know, did you hear about what Pastor Caleb did? Oh, my goodness. When you hear this, right there, just stop right there. I'm not going to partake in gossip. Go talk to the source. If you've got a problem with someone, go talk to that person. Don't go talk to someone else about your problems. Come on, that's petty. That's not Christ-like. If you've got an issue with someone, if someone has wronged you, go talk with them. Don't go to your neighbor and say, hey, man, you, this is what they did to me. Can you believe it? You sound like, oh, it's like a whining baby. Just go deal with it in love. That's what love does. I've got a problem with you. Okay, let's talk it out, man. Let's hash this thing out. Let's work it out because relationship's not on the table. Because I choose to love you more than the problems that's going on with us. It's about more than that. It's about being bigger and better people. It's about being like Christ. And Christ doesn't go around, oh, you know what he did? Rejoices in the truth. Love rejoices in the truth. Point 11. On the contrary... Love rejoices in things that are pure and true and holy. That's what love is. Focusing on those things. You know what? Even if he did this, or even if this was wrong, I'm choosing to see him as more than that. I'm choosing to confess this as more than that. To confess over this person, whoever it is that may have wronged you. I'm choosing to love. It's greater. And that's where it's hard. Because it's easy to love in theory. Worship team, come on up. It's easy to love in theory. It's harder to love in practical application. It's much, much harder. And that's why I think we have to be very, that's why I challenge you today, that these kinds of things cause you to actually, to, to really self-reflect, to look at yourself and say, man, where's my love level? Because I know that I've responded some of these ways that aren't right. I, I'm so guilty here, okay? I'm not preaching at you, I'm preaching to me. <laughs> come on. I'm a person too. I don't, he... <laughs> this is, it's, love is just, is, love is so much more. And if we just dismiss this love thing as, oh, it's just, it's just love, then we've missed it. Then we've missed it. And it's going to be hard for us to operate and walk in love and be a true picture of who Christ is. Because that's what we're trying to be, right? Christians, Little Christs, we're trying to look like him in, in every aspect of our life. And everything that we do, that's, that's, that's what we're trying to do. At least that's, the, that's my goal. I hope that's your goal, to allow him to transform you to looking like him. And that kind of a love is a choice that we have to choose. You know what? I'm not going to hold a record of wrongdoing against you. I'm not holding that against you. You know what? I'm going to be patient with you and I'm going to be kind. I'm not going to be easily angered or provoked. That's not what love is. Love is patient. And I choose to be that today. I choose to love first. Amen? Stand with me this morning. Thank you, Jesus. May these words be written on your heart today. May, not, may they be tattooed onto your heart. 
that this is what love is. This is the makeup of love. So that you never forget this is God. Because here's an easy thing. If God is love, let's just replace all the times it says love in that verse, in that chapter, with God or Jesus. Jesus is patient. Jesus is kind. And if we're going to be little Jesuses, amen? So replace yourself with love in this chapter. That's my homework for you. Go home and, and look up 1 Corinthians 13, and every spot that it says love, write your name. And begin to confess that over yourself. Because we have to begin to speak these things and see ourselves as this. Amen? Your words have power. Make that declaration today. And every morning, every night, keep it in front of your eyes. Let it be tattooed on your heart. This is who I am. This is my anthem. This is me. I am love, just like my Father, the source of agape love. Amen? Let's pray together. Father, Lord, we just thank you for your love and for who you are, for being love and being such a wonderful picture of what that is and for showing us each and every day how to, to, to walk that out more and more and more and more. And I just pray that over your people today that we are filled with your love. Lord, that we receive your love first so that we, we can operate, walk in it and distribute and to share that love with others. Father, may, may your words be tattooed on our hearts. May we never forget, may we keep them in front of our eyes that this is so important. This is, this is who you are. This is what it's about. That we love first today. I come against anything that would stand in the way of that right now. I, I curse you in Jesus' name. You have no place in these people. Whether it's selfishness, whether it's deceit, whether it's self-doubt, I'm not worthy of love. I have a word for you. You are worthy today. God said you're worthy. I sent my son to die for you. Receive it today. Receive the love of Christ today. I declare that over your people. May we be your heart walking in love and demonstrating that to the world today. And may our makeup be love's makeup. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's worship the Lord together.